talk a little bit about the Shopify stack. We're going to talk a little bit about knowing what to scale, um, and then how Shopify caches and what we do to scale beyond just caching. At the end, I have a little bit about how to split things up and how we use that to help us scale out Shopify. So what exactly is Shopify? I don't know if everyone knows what Shopify is, um, but we're a hosted e-commerce platform. We've been using Rails since 2004, uh, and it's the same code base. Uh, we've never done a rewrite. We've like went from Rails 1 or pre-1 uh, all the way up to Rails 3.2 now, which is pretty cool. Just to give you a look of like what Shopify looks like, this is our admin, this is where you manage orders. Um, so you do order management, product management for your store, and lets you sell things online. A couple example shops, so GitHub has their shop up on Shopify. Um, we've been hosting them for a while now, uh, which is really cool. Another little example is Dodo Pace. They sell on Shopify as well, which is pretty neat. We're really like glad to have uh, people like GitHub and Dodo Pace on Shopify. It's really cool. So a bit about our stack. So what does Shopify run on? What, is our, what does it look like and how does it compare to other people? Please. On our way. Thank you. <laughs> that was awkward. <laughs> so our stack, we're on Ruby 193. Uh, we try and keep up with the patch levels, uh, with the performance patches. So we're on P385 now. Rails 3.2 went out a few months ago, which was really awesome. We use a component flavor of MySQL 5.5. We're running Unicorn. Uh, we have a couple patches into Unicorn that are now on Master as well, which have helped out how we, uh, our performance with Unicorn. We use Memcache 1.4.14 and Redis 2.6. So what does an app server look like? We have Nginx in the front, Unicorn Workers, then we have Rails and Ruby. We have 53 app servers running a total of 1,590 Unicorn Workers, five job servers, and 370 job workers, which is really amazing. So lots of processes, lots of workers, lots of hardware. So what does this look like? Just kind of a little hardware diagram to, to show you what how the app servers like interact with things. We have the firewall in front, load balancer, app server is kind of in the middle of everything with search, memcache, Redis, uh, the DB, and job servers. So pretty standard, I think a lot of people have their, their stack set up like this, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah. Code base. So we have 55,000 lines of Ruby code. Uh, I recently added this line about CoffeeScript because we have been rebuilding our front-end and in, in mostly CoffeeScript. So we're approaching 16,000 lines of CoffeeScript, which is really amazing. 81,000 lines of test code, 211 controllers, nearing 500 models. So a lot of code, uh, a lot of stuff to manage, uh, and it's like really cool to be working on something like Yeah, so this is all just the Shopify application. We have other apps like surrounding Shopify, but this is just the Shopify core code base. So what is our current scale? So these are some numbers from the past year of what we've been doing. So last year we processed 9.9 .9 million orders, so that works out to be an order every 3.2 seconds. Really amazing. During Cyber Monday, our busiest time of the year, we processed 2,008 sales per minute, which is just crazy. And these numbers are doubling year over year. Uh, so next year, we have to look forward to processing 4,000 sales per minute, which is really crazy. We average about 50,000 RPM at about 45 millisecond response time. So this is just our like day-to-day, -day, Sunday afternoon sort of RPM. This fluctuates drastically all over the place, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later. So last year, we processed 13.3 billion requests. Uh, we have a lot of customers, so interruption disrupts them. Uptime is like really important to us. 
and this number is growing faster. The number of requests is growing faster than customers and revenue. So it's really a challenging problem to be on top of. So before I get into like the meat of the talk, I really want to talk about kind of where we came from because it's really interesting. I know David sort of was talking about the history of Rails and I have a similar sort of thing with Shopify um, because it's really interesting to look at like where we've come over time and sort of the problems we've had to deal with and where we are now. So looking back, the first line of code to Shopify was written in 2004. So that was about a year after, I think, uh, David started working on Basecamp. So Toby uh, hooked up with David and like found Rails and they started working on a lot of the similar things together, which was really cool. Shopify was released in June of 2006. And as I said, it's the same code base since then. Uh, I can go back in GitHub to the first commit, which is like an import from an old repo uh, from like 2005, I think, and see the Rails code from there. Uh, we have the whole history from that point forward, which is really amazing. So it's over nine years of Rails upgrades, improvements, and changes. So the first commit that I can go back to, I went back there and like did a little bit of stats on it because uh, I thought that was cool. I like looking at stuff from the past and looking at statistics, and I think that's pretty neat. So we had almost 7,000 lines of application code, 4,000 lines of test code, you know, 38 controllers, 77 models. So we've grown a lot over time. And the stack was Ruby 182, Rails Pre-1, uh, MySQL 4, Lighty, and Memcache. So if anyone was working with Rails, even remotely around then, you'll sort of remember that there was no RJS, there was no respond to, no nested includes or polymorphic associations, Capistrano didn't exist, rest and resources weren't even being considered, scopes didn't exist, no rack or gem files or thread safety. So none of this stuff was there. Um, and we've been slowly upgrading and taking advantage of all this stuff over time and dealing with it when we've, it hasn't been available, which is really cool. So into the meat of the talk. So a big part of trying to scale a system is you have to know what the system is about and know all the pieces involved before you can begin scaling it. There's no like magical formula to scaling. It's all about knowing the characteristics of your particular system, and every single one is different and changing or removing the constraints that it imposes. So for us, one of the big constraints is that we have one request serving each process. We're on unicor standard unicorn, so we're not using rainbows, so each request means a process uh, to run it in. So this is really what we have, the, one of the main limits we have to work within and deal with. And with that constraint, we're also constrained by the number of connections to the DB and we're left making these processes faster to speed things up. That's the main thing we can do to make things faster. So a little bit on RPM, which I mentioned earlier. So that's request per minute. So you can figure out RPM pretty easily um, by looking at the number of workers times one over the average response time. So if I dump in the numbers we had before, our 1,590 workers um, and like a 72 millisecond response time, which is in our 90th percentile uh, for response times, you can get a back a sort of a optimal sort of RPM that we can potentially reach of 1.3 million. So this is potential RPM. This doesn't take into account any potential bottlenecks or overhead, but based on the app workers and if we can make everything within those processes lightning fast, this is the potential we can work towards. So we're kind of left with two knobs to dial when we're scaling Shopify, bumping up the workers and reducing response time. And these are the two things we focus on. Adding workers, we add app servers and add database connections so that we can do that. And dropping down response time is a big part of what the rest of this talk will be about. So knowing the system, 
In Shopify, a big part of what we're doing is a lot of DB hits as sales are happening, as things are changing. So we're very write intensive to the DB. So this makes it a bit harder to cache things. Uh, we also have a lot of network requests as we're querying shipping services or payment gateways or anything that we need to reach out um, or even talking to Memcache or Redis. There's a lot of system calls there. We also have to focus on the storefront and checkout. These are the most important parts to Shopify. So these are the things we, we focus on. The storefront is the pages where you, you go, you see the products, and you browse around. This is where our customers' customers are hitting. And this is really important to make this fast so that our customers can sell things. And then the checkout is when people are actually buying things. So we really want to make sure going through the checkout and actually being able to exchange money is really fast because that's the cornerstone to what Shopify is. We also have this sort of interesting anomaly which we call the Chive. So I don't know if you guys have heard of the Chivery.com. Um, they're a website. They have like funny pictures and stuff. They also do flash sales. Um, so they put like 10,000 products for sale and sell them in about five minutes at most. So this is really interesting because we have enormous spikes uh, in the requests that we need to process during these flash sales. So as I mentioned earlier, our average response time is around 50 RPM, so 50,000 requests per minute. During a flash chive sale, it spikes to over 200K. And this wasn't the biggest one. We had a couple weeks ago that our largest one spiked to over 300,000 requests per minute. So we have to work within that average sort of data day range of 50,000 requests per minute, but we also need to have this sort of breathing room to be able to handle up to 400 or 500,000 requests per minute at just the drop of a hat, because we don't necessarily know when they're going to have these flash sales. So it creates a really interesting sort of environment. We've had to deal with being able to scale and being able to handle this sort of intense traffic out of nowhere. What's really important when trying to scale out your application is just measuring everything. Every piece of data, every measurement you can find will help you. Uh, the key sort of things that we're looking at, we use New Relic so much. Like New Relic is the best thing ever. It tells you a lot of information about your app servers, a lot of information about requests and uh, what the system's doing. It's really great. We use another tool called Splunk, which holds all of our logs and makes it easy to search through the logs and generate reports and get insight into how the system has been historically uh, working. One of the problems we've noticed with New Relic is the historical data is harder to get at because they sort of even out the curves. But with Splunk, we have all of our logs, and we can look into that historical data and gain insights from it. We also use StatsD a lot for any sort of uh, measurements that New Relic doesn't give us, and Cacti for the MySQL end, getting insight into what the database is actually doing. We also built a tool called Conan that lets us hammer the system with requests to be able to load test it. So this, uh, this tool spins up EC2 instances, and we have test plans that it drives the storefront uh, using real requests, real storefront traffic, uh, to be able to push the limits of the system to see where we'll fall down again, uh, which is really amazing and a really important part to like figuring out where you need to scale. So a little look at New Relic. Um, you can see your app re response time, throughput, all those sorts of things. You can drill into all this information, see where things are slow. All this data is super important to figuring out where you need to scale. Because if you don't know where you need to scale, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, knowing what the real problems are is the hardest thing you need to solve. Once you know where the problems are, actually fixing them is usually trivial. Splunk is another tool here. These are some graphs from Splunk just uh, showing our checkout completion rate and some response errors. But we can generate any sort of graphs based on the log data we have. So we dump whatever we can into the logs that might be usual, useful historically. Uh, to see how, how things are changing over time. We also installed dashboards in most of the sort of rooms in Shopify. 
to give an idea of how things are working. So this is our, a piece of our performance dashboard, just showing what our RPM is at, response times, uh, just to put that information right in front of everyone so they know what they're focusing on and what they need to deal with. During the lead up to Cyber Monday, we had a huge push to improve the performance of the storefront because we knew we were getting double the traffic this year. Um, so what we did was literally printed out the whole request through the storefront, every sort of DB hit, every memcache hit, and we went through and like crossed them off. We just eliminated whatever we could and crossed it off the board. Printing it out like this was really a really great thing for the team because it gave them, again, a real enemy to attack. You could go up and look and see, okay, we're doing these database hits and we can get rid of them and you can cross them off and you actually like have a lot of, you have something that you can attack, which is really important when you're, when you're in a crunch to scale things out. So how do we actually improve the performance of the requests? So a big part of this is caching. Uh, we have a couple of tools that we use to help with caching. The first one is Cacheable. So this is controller-based page caching, and it's memcache-backed, and it's heavily used within the storefront and checkout. So we've open-sourced it so everyone can use it. Uh, it's, it does a lot of different things. It's actually comparable to what David was talking about with the key-based. So it's a genera generalizational cache. So as the generation changes, uh, the cache gets invalidated, and you have a new cache key, and so the old data just falls out of the cache. Uh, some of the things we've done in here that are kind of interesting is we actually serve up gzip content. So we put the content gzipped into memcache, and then we serve it up like straight to the browser gzipped if we can, and only if the browser doesn't support gzip content, then we deflate it. Uh, so this was a pretty huge win and really easy to do within Cacheable. We also use e-tags and three or four not modifieds a lot so that the browser can send up the, the e-tag and we can just respond with a 304 not modified and not have to pull it out of the cache or anything like that. And there's also no explicit expiry with this one, so you don't need to worry about expiring it. Very similar to what David was saying, uh, you just increase the, increment the keys, and it falls out of the cache. What we do is a little bit differently with Cacheable and our page caches is instead of using the objects and the timestamps, we actually have a version incrementer on our shop. So the shop object is the key to everything in Shopify. As things change, uh, the shop ties it all together. So as products change, we actually increment a version counter on the shop and that's what we use as part of the cache key. So as any piece changes, uh, it increments that cache key. So a little piece of code from just an example of how you can use cacheable in your controllers. It's pretty straightforward. You just use the response cache and you can define a cache key. Uh, it can be parts of the requests. Uh, you could use the ID of the object and the timestamp. We use the shop version in our case. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to add to any sort of controller. And we use this heavily within the storefront, which is one of our most heavily hit areas. So a little example sort of graph of how Cacheable, we had like some huge wins in Cacheable. Uh, initially, we weren't caching 404s, um, which may not be that big of a deal for most apps um, because you just have a static 404 file. In Shopify, you can actually customize using templating every single sort of aspect of the storefront, and 404s are included. So our 404 files are actually dynamic files that are generated per shop. Um, and initially, we weren't caching them. So when we introduced the cacheable caching on the 404s, we had a significant flip in how many cache hits versus misses and response times once we did that, which was really amazing. Another big piece to our caching story is identity cache. So this is memcached back and it's read through caching. So we read through, the, through to the database and then when it's coming out, we store the object in memcache. Um, and then when the next request comes in, we can read it from memcache if it hasn't changed. This is model-based caching and we're using it throughout the storefront and the admin now. 
So identity cache is open source as well. We open sourced this a couple months ago. And it's used to cache full model objects in memcache. So we actually like Marshall dump them to memcache and read them out as we need them. So we can also include associated objects in the class. And we've made it an opt-in caching. So kind of different from the caching that David was talking about where it's implicit and happens automatically for you, we've made the decision to make it opt-in because caching is really hard. And sometimes you don't want things to be cached, and sometimes you do. So we made it opt-in so that you must explicitly request the cached versions. Uh, this makes it a lot easier to have certain pages not use the cached versions and be able to update things and roll this out across the board without introducing just all this implicit caching that maybe we don't understand or maybe is a lot harder to debug. Uh, so this makes it a lot easier to figure out. It also doesn't use explicit expiry, or it is explicit expiry, um, but it's automatic. So like the instead, in comparison with cacheables, which is generational, so you change the key and it falls off, this we actually explicitly expire the objects when needed. We use this by hooking into after commit and after touch to expire the keys as they change. So a little code example of identity cache. It's pretty straightforward. This might actually be a little bit out of date. On the gem, there's some examples of how to use it. But you can just say which the indexes are, um, which you use to actually fetch the data from the cache. And you can set up multiple indexes so you can fetch it based on different data that you might have. And you can also embed different objects so that you can include the associated objects with the parent uh, and pull those all out in one, in one call. And when the child objects expire, it'll expire whatever it needs to throughout the chain. So a little example of where introducing identity cache to a piece of the system made a big change in uh, our response times. This is, uh, we have links throughout the shop, so you have different links which can include collections or whatever you want in your storefront. And finding those, we're hitting the database. These don't often change, so adding them to identity cache and memcache was a huge win uh, because since they don't change very often, we can always just pull them out of the cache and not hit, have to hit the database. So the next, next section, get out of my process. So the easiest way to speed up a process is just like remove stuff from it. Whatever doesn't need to be in the main running process, just get rid of it uh, so that you're not tying up that process and it can quickly serve up the page and move on to serving another request. So initially we had delayed jobs which stored jobs in the database and we had workers running in different processes and these workers pulled periodically uh, to pull jobs out. We added this in 2007 for our search indexing, and workers still use up like a process with database connections, and since delayed job is storing the objects in the database, that's a lot more uh, database work that we don't need to do. So as we have added more jobs and used delayed job more, it became more expensive to pull the jobs out of the DB and to work them off. So eventually we moved to rescue. So we moved to rescue in 2010. Uh, so this is Redis backed. And one of the like, big wins with rescue is it's an order one operation to pop jobs. So we can keep adding jobs, throwing jobs into the worker or into the queue, and popping them off is always really quick, which is great. It's also significantly faster due to the fact that it can pop them off so quickly. I have a link in the notes that I can share, but uh, some benchmarks were done, and you can do 300 jobs per second versus 120 jobs per second, which is a huge difference, and when you're using background processing a lot, it can, it can really add up. And Rescue is really extensible. They have a lot of plugins that we take advantage of for like statuses and tracking and stuff like that. Uh, so it's a really great uh, system for getting things out of your main process. Once we introduced Rescue for background processing, we started using it for a lot, a lot of different things as well. 
Um, so we can background sending email, background processing payments, geolocation, all kinds of these things can be put into Redis jobs, or rescue jobs, and we process over 2,000 jobs per minute, which is really crazy on those five job servers. So this is just an example of what happened when we started backgrounding payment processing. So payment processing is kind of interesting because it needs to hit a lot of different systems. So it gets pretty slow. Um, a single authorization has to hit the payment gateway, it has to hit the processor, it has to hit the processing network for that credit card, and then it has to come all the way back through that. So the payment gateway is the one thing we're interacting with, but it's interacting with all these other systems, making those requests pretty slow at times. So putting this in the background had a huge win because we could let them work off at their own pace and we could present a nice page to the user and let that process move on to serving another user so that they could check out and uh, make their sales. I think a lot of people have used rescue, but I just included a little example here. Like creating a rescue job is really simple. You just, the main part of it is the perform and you just enqueue the job. Uh, it's really straightforward, really easy to add to any application. Yeah, since we now have Redis, we can use Redis for a lot of other things. So we started using it for our inventory reservation system, for sessions, for theme uploads. When, when the theme, which is a large zip file, is uploaded, we put it into Redis so that we don't need to process it right away. And then we have a worker just pull it off of Redis and do the work on it. We use Redis for throttling and for carts. So carts are really interesting because it's one of the things that changes most often during the storefront. As people are browsing around, adding, through their cart, adding things to their cart, it changes really often. So adding those to Redis was a huge win. One key thing with Redis, though, is that you have to really pay attention to potential race conditions. So you still want your canonical values in MySQL or whichever data store um, in case of stale data or service failure. Uh, so adding this extra moving piece is really tricky to deal with, but you need, to, you need to manage those sort of issues depending on the problem you're needing to solve. Sometimes you need to make it more complicated to speed things up. So for Shopify specifically, a lot of, a lot of it leads to MySQL. Like we're hitting MySQL a lot, the data's changing a lot, so we need to hit MySQL to make sure everything's up to date and to keep the data in sync. So what does our MySQL hardware look like? We have four times eight core processor, SSDs, 256 gigs of RAM, and we have the full working set in memory. So this was really interesting. I was talking to our DBA about this, having the full working set in memory, and he was saying doing this, uh, we were able to see about a 10 to 15 times improvement uh, just because you didn't have to hit the disks anymore. It was all ready, all available to read out. So that's really important. So MySQL query optimization. So we use PT Query Digest, which is a tool from Percona that helps you an analyze the logs to find slow queries. It lets you help you find uh, deadlocks or anything that MySQL is doing. You can feed it the logs and it'll help you figure out what's going on. So that's really helpful. You also want to avoid queries that generate temp tables. So this is really easy to cause. If you have an order by with a different group by clause, uh, MySQL will use a temp table. And this is really bad because it'll just chew up memory and depending on how big the temp table is, that can push your data out of, the, out of RAM, um, uh, which gets really slow. So we want to avoid that. And then the other thing is forcing or ignoring indexes. So in Shopify, a big part of what is happening or what you're interacting with is the orders. So we have a lot of indexes on the orders to make it fast in different situations. And for the most part, MySQL is good at figuring this out, but sometimes we need to, to prod it in the right direction. So you can actually tell MySQL to, to use a particular index or to ignore a particular index that might be incorrect in a particular case but you really need to dig deep into what is going on uh, with MySQL and with your database to be able to figure out 
which, which of these things you need to do. MySQL tuning. So we recently hired a MySQL DBA, which has been incredible. If any of these things are interesting to you or you need to do it, uh, you probably should be hiring a DBA to help you with this. Uh, because like, we're all Rails devs, we like to code Ruby and Rails, but knowing someone or having someone who can dig deep into the database uh, and figure all this stuff out is a huge win. And we had a lot of huge wins from having this DBA on. I know if you're using Postgres, there's a few like consulting companies, or uh, with MySQL, there's Percona, which is a consulting company. Uh, if you're at the scale where tweaking these sorts of available variables is what you need to do, you should really look at these consultants or a DBA because they can do it way faster than you'll ever be able to figure it out. Uh, but anyways, there's a few things here that were really interesting that we did. Uh, so we disabled the InnoDB stats on metadata. So what this is, is Active Record regularly does a describe command. And what MySQL does by default is it randomly samples when you do the describe command. So disabling that random sampling has no impact for the describe command, but it was a significant amount of work that we removed from MySQL that it just didn't need to do. We also increased the table open cache. So this allowed us to have more tables open at once. One important thing that you need to keep in mind when you're tweaking these variables is there's often other repercussions. So when we increase the to table open cache and we're able to have more tables open at once, that increased the number of file descriptors. So you need to make sure you can have that many open file descriptors on the DB at that time or else you're just gonna run into a different problem. And then another thing we changed was the InnoDB auto ink lock mode. Uh, we changed that to interleave. So this allowed us to improve the performance of inserts into tables that were auto incrementing, which most of your tables with Rails would be. Um, the drawback to this is it potentially degrades performance when using bulk inserts, uh, which we weren't doing, so it wasn't a problem for us. Uh, but the fact that we were improving the inserts, which is really a big part of Shopify, was a big win there. Something that's actually missing off this slide is we also changed the memory allocator in MySQL. So we switched to TC malloc. Um, so MySQL actually has a number, I think a half dozen of memory allocators that have different characteristics. For us, TC malloc worked really well. Um, because we saw less contention during high load and when doing context switches within MySQL, uh, which we were seeing a lot of. So switching to TC malloc was a big win for us. Uh, there's a lot of different memory allocators that you can look into, and depending on the characteristics of your system, uh, some of those might work better for you. So after commit. We use after commit heavily uh, because it lets us keep things sort of out of that main DB transaction. We want to close off those transactions as quickly as possible so the database can move on to doing something else. So this gets fired after a transaction has been committed. We use these a lot for things like webhooks and cache expiry, updating associated objects. So these things don't necessarily have to happen in the main DB transaction. We can have those happen afterwards. Another important thing to note is if you're doing those sorts of things in an after save, if an uh, yeah, exception occurs, that'll roll back the whole transaction. The difference here in after commit, the main transaction has already happened. So if any issue happens within after commit itself, like the webhook failed, it won't roll back the transaction that was generating the webhook itself. So we can then just retry the webhook in the background. So after commit is pretty easy to use. We often sort of use this pattern of flagging something in after save for after commit because you don't have access to the changes uh, within after commit itself. So within after save, we look at what's changed and decide if we need to do an after commit call. Uh, and then after commit, we can do the actual work, like push a job or whatever we need to do. So services. Um, one interesting thing with services is a lot of people are talking about service-oriented architecture and pulling things out to services. One thing we've 
really tried to do at Shopify is to make sure everything gets extracted as a service. So almost everything we've done started out in Shopify and we pulled it out into a service as it became necessary. Starting out building services all over the place is going to introduce a lot of complexity to your application. So you really want to extract these out as it becomes necessary because it's gonna be harder to manage all those things. You have deployment dependencies, you have different changes between the services, the services need to all be up or you need to handle when services go away. Um, so you really want to wait until it's necessary to, to start to pull things out into services. I think Brian Morton has a talk about services later and it was really good, I saw it at Big Ruby. Uh, I'd highly recommend checking that out. So a little bit about what we do with services at Shopify. So as I said, splitting out the services as needed. Uh, one big benefit to splitting out the services is you can independently scale them. So if the service has different characteristics to the main application, you can scale it out based on those characteristics. You can also segment the metrics. So your request per minute might be offset because you have a particular service that is hit highly often. Uh, I'd say what David was talking about with the polling could potentially offset their metrics because that's happening a lot often. If you can like segment those metrics and look at them separately, you can see what the application itself is doing and what the polling service is doing um, and be able to deal with the constraints of each of those systems independently. So one example of a service that we've extracted out of Shopify is imagery. So in, in the beginning when imagery was part of Shopify, we had Nginx serving images from the file system. The files were shared with the app server's owner over NFS. Uh, this was not the best, but it got Shopify started and it got it where it needed to be. Um, as this sort of became the bottleneck, we were able to extract imagery out into its own service. Initially, we also pre-transformed all the images into various sizes up front, but once we extracted imagery out, it made it really easy to have it dynamically transform the images to the different sizes it needed to be. One like interesting thing with imagery is we can scale out the different pieces and have hardware specific to the needs, so we have a piece of hardware that is mostly disks because HA proxy is uh, storing the dynamically resized images and it can serve those off the, or out of RAM really fast. Sorry, it was RAM, not disk. Um, and then we have the imaging servers which are just doing resizing and mostly CPU intensive so we can scale those out as we need to. So extracting this out into its separate piece made it really easy to scale out the imaging part of Shopify independently of the rest of the application. It's kind of what I want to leave you with at the end of this talk is just, you really need to adapt and evolve as needed. You can't predict it upfront what you're gonna need to scale. You need to use the data and use knowledge of the system to drive your decisions. You need to look at what it's doing and how the system is interacting with all the different pieces to figure out what parts you need to change. There's no special formula to doing this. You really need to look at the data and look at how your system works. So knowing the application and infrastructure, keeping slow IO and CPU out of the main process, and measuring your optimizations. Measurement's really important because you can and probably will at times make things worse and you need to know when you're making things worse so you can undo it. Thanks. <laughs>